Hello and welcome to episode 12 of the Comic Book Showcase. My name is Jamie Hari, founder of the Marvel and DC Databases, and I'm joined, as always, by Mike, Rab, and Kyle, the illustrious trio. Um, today we have a great show on for you. We're going to be talking about uh, uh, seven issues we just read of Forever Evil, um, written by Jeff Johns, uh, penciled by David Finch, and inked by Richard Friend, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I like the books myself, uh, definitely an energetic read, it sort of uh, crescendoed as the, the seven books went on, and the seventh book kind of packed a big punch, a big finish. Um, Kyle, why don't you tell us a little bit about the books and what happened and what you thought of it? Uh, well, the main uh, story plot is that uh, an evil, reverse, uh, whatever you want to call it, version of the Justice League uh, comes from their home dimension to Earth and immediately uh, just takes out the Justice League. Uh, they're basically the, the Justice League is is not even present for almost the entire book. So uh, there's a world where they're, the biggest heroes are gone and their exact opposites from an evil universe are here running everything. So once the, the evil version comes, they basically unite the world's villains against the world. And uh, there's really not much that the, uh, the heroes that are left can do to stop these guys. They're pretty much running... Uh, over the, the planet, and so a few heroes managed to escape, uh, Batman, Catwoman, uh, and Cyborg. Cyborg is critically injured, and it was really no use to the heroes for most, most of the series, so uh, the world's fate kind of comes down to Batman and a few villains that decide to reject the new evil crime syndicate. So one of the, the big things that happened is Lex Luthor decides that he does not want to give over this world, so... Lex ends up being kind of the, the protagonist of the, the book, and uh, he teams up with Batman and uh, Captain Cold and a couple other villains to take on this evil Justice League from another dimension. And what did you think of the book? Uh, I thought it started really slow, and I thought that the plot really didn't do much. It just kind of showed the, the evil crime syndicate people kind of being evil, and other villains from Earth just kind of being villains, there wasn't a whole lot going on until about the last issue. The the remaining heroes and uh, the the villains that decided to revolt kind of teamed up and uh, they you know finally won. And I thought that that was finally you know some plot movement towards the very end of the book. I didn't think was there the first three or four issues at least. Well, I th I think there was a lot going on, but I think it was a lot of build up. It was a lot of no resolution. It was just sort of okay. Now introduce these characters and those characters and this plot point, and uh, I, I think that's where sort of the energy and flow of the first few issues went. Would you guys disagree with that? Well, see, I think it, a lot of it happened outside of these main seven titles. There was a lot that you had to take for granted that took place in the tie-in books for the Rogue series, the Argus series. I mean, I never initially I started reading in the beginning, but there was just there was a whole lot going on there, and I just wanted to focus on the main story. But things seemed to happen that either made you want to like want they wanted to push out those other books, or um, it just happened like and ignored like what was going on inside the book and just happened out there, and then you had to like go off and read them, but I didn't, like, I wasn't bothered to, so I don't know certain things that happened, like what happened to uh, Lantern's Ring, and it just, like, there was a lot of, you really had to do that whole tie-in to get the full story, and it was lacking in the main story in that way. I did that. I read every tie-in, uh, even the ones that I didn't like, I read them all the way through. Uh, but I think one of the important things about the series is that it flows directly from Trinity War, like the last summer's big event. It flows straight out of that, and there's events that happened in Trinity War that if you don't know about them, then maybe half the crap like where the Justice League even is makes no sense to you because you don't know. You don't know where they are. But that's the whole point. Ramping up to Forever Evil was Forever Evil is the culmination of Trinity War, basically, where the Trinity War was all about this Pandora's box thing, and then turns out Pandora's box is the door to this other world where the evil guys come from. So that's kind of interesting. Um, but I thought the the series itself was uh, interesting. I thought when I read it again uh, for this. 
I felt like it was better standalone at the beginning. Like it introduces characters well. It uh, like it sets up its own plot better than I thought it did because I was reading it as like straight out of uh, Trinity War. So it was more like a, it was like oh yeah, more of this Trinity War crap rather than like a whole new story that was setting itself up and having a regular plot arc that you would expect from a standalone series. <sighs> So let's talk about let's talk briefly about the, the the people that came through the sort of the alternate uh, versions uh, of the you know Justice League the Injustice League if you will. Um, so they some of the ca- the takes on some of those characters were different than we saw pre New Fifty Two. Um, what what was different? What what was good? What was bad? How are they? How did those characters compare to not only their counterparts in Justice League but also their sort of former selves in in pre Fifty Two. Um, versions. They in the in the Forever Evil, they are not actually fleshed out that much. You don't get to find out that much about who they are on the other like what the differences are other than that they are evil. So that's a it's all in Justice League, the book. Like while all the Justice League is gone, the uh, crime syndicate basically takes over the Justice League title and you find out about them during the event. So that's how that worked out. And that's one of the things I was about to say, was that you don't really know too much about them to compare them to their previous selves. You kind of have to take guesses from that actual main storyline. Once again, you have to go into the tie-ins to figure out more about them. But you do learn, like, little things about them, like that Superwoman is very manipulative, um, that the alternative Flash apparently enjoys children, um, and uh, what else there was there... Um, the um, I cannot remember what he's called, but the alternate Green Lantern, um, very paranoid, like the just completely afraid of everything and anything, like completely just eaten up by fear. Um, it, I thought they did really well with the characters, but I would love to have seen more done with them. I felt that they were kind of wasted in this. Um, seven-story arc, and knowing that I can go back and read a little bit more about them in the Justice League books makes me kind of interested, but, I mean, some of them got completely destroyed in the series, so there's I, like there's no future for them. I would have liked to have seen more about them, maybe have them playing around in the background for, like, instead of being in a seven-issue arc, like, so soon, save them up for a little bit later, maybe. Um... But compared to their good selves, um, I don't know that they gave enough of the evilness that contrasted their um, good selves. Owlman seemed to be really more concerned in Nightwing than like the the manipulative, manipulative evil. Like I, I felt that they the movie. Justice League, um, a Crisis of Two Earth. Yeah, they really portrayed the team really well there, and I don't think that they did it as well in this series. What about Bizarro? Bizarro was a different take on the character. Um, you know, obviously a creation of um, Lex Luthor. He seemed to be almost like a little bit of a, a lost puppy or something like that. Like he was very emotional, very uh, uh, tied at the hip to Lex. Um, how did we feel about the sort of the, the portrayal of Bizarro or the creature, as it were, um, in this story? Like, I, I don't know. I, I, I liked him, which is weird because I don't normally like Bizarro, but I liked him, and then he died, and then screw you, Jeff Johns. That's what I have to say about that. Well, I like it because they have the ability to bring him back now, um, but I'll, it's going to take five years, so I don't know how soon we're going to see it. Um, but... Like, yeah, he was a really, like, likable character compared to the original Bizarro's. Um, he, the way that he interacted with Luther, I think, was the way that, like, made it for me. Because he's, like, at one point, he's handing Luther a flower, and Luther's like, no, like, piss off, I'm trying to get you to do stuff. And he's like, no, like, take my flower. And Luther's like, seriously, like, go grab that satellite. I need to do stuff. I have this plan. You're, like, go grab it. And he's like, take the goddamn flower. <laughs> Luther's like, fine, I'll take a flower. And he's like, all right, here's your satellite dish. He's like, she... Oh! Like, <laughs> like, I enjoyed seeing 
I don't know, Luther get like uh like it got to him. It got to Luther in a way that like that good Superman gets to Luther. Bizarro's little like innocence, the childlikeness, like was just eating at him. And then in the end, Luther's like all like all t- crying over him. He's like, "Oh, it is my monster." I I liked it. I I like that he's a very sympathetic character. Like you, like you were saying, like you you like him a lot, even though I think one of the things that makes him better than Bizarro, like as we knew him before, is the fact that. He doesn't talk very much, because Bizarro in, like, say, Jeff Loeb's Superman Batman book, you can't understand a word there, like, because they always write what he says, like, in the reverse of what it means, but it doesn't make any sense to you because you're a human who speaks English. So when you get this character who's just like, that's good, that's helpful, because you can, you can, like, he speaks with his eyes and with his body language and that's helpful to you rather than like it's a, it's a more interesting version of the character than one that's just confusing you and being kind of like postmodern so so that actually makes me think of something else so the way that um Lex interplays with Bizarro gives us a sense that or at least gives me a sense that Lex was like the father figure in this, you know, and it and it sort of exposes some of his emotions and some of his uh, uh, different aspects of morality. So, what did we think of like Lex's unique morality in this uh, in this story? Like, I, I would argue it's different from other Lexes or from you know what we've seen in the past, where he's pretty chaotic. I wouldn't say chaotic evil, but sort of more, you know, like I'll just do whatever the hell I want. But it seems like now he has more a benevolent streak almost for the better good of earth. Yeah, I thought it was definitely a good a different take. It was it was nice to see Lex as kind of a sympathetic uh almost, you know, hero instead of the unrepentant, you know, bad guy that he's always been to Superman in the past. I thought uh it was really kind of a interesting take and something that I'm really looking forward to see how they play with it going forward. I agree. I think he's still He's still very cold, like cold, like cold blooded. Like he would still crush Atomica under his foot, but he's also like his morality isn't so much one of like this is good and this is bad. It's like he's out for himself, and what suits him right now is saving the world. Like it's not lawful. Like there's a lawful good or lawful evil in, say, uh, the the rogues, like Captain Cold, and he, uh, the, the rogues, I'm good, sort of going to go off on a tangent about the rogues, but the rogues have this morality where they don't kill, and it's, it's like the Three Musketeers where it's all for one and one for all, and they sort of play with that in the Rogues uh, Rebellion book. But anyway, his morality is more like We don't want Central City destroyed because that's our city where we steal shit. Why would we want that destroyed? So that's why he joins up. But then Luther's ideology is more like, Superman is gone. Everybody loves Superman. I'm going to show the world that they were wrong to love Superman by being way more awesome than Superman could ever have been by beating the guys that took him out. And that's exactly what he does, and that's how we get Lex Luthor as a member of the Justice League. That's cool, I think. So, uh, absolutely, I agree, and I just want to touch on one last thing. We were running a little bit short on time. Um, So, at the very end, sort of the last panel, the last book, um, we finally reveal who this, or what this uh, sort of scary force from the nether regions is that is uh, scaring the crap out of uh, the crime syndicate and whatnot, and that turns out to be Anti-Monitor. So um, I'm going to pose a co- uh, sort of a closing question uh, to the group, and then I'll put it out to the audience. Um, where do you think the Anti-Monitor story is going? Will they uh, rehash, uh, I guess, Crisis on Infinite Earths, or are we in store for something all new? Uh, where's, where's, this, this, where's this taking us? Who knows where it's taking us? <laughs> I mean, like... They seem to be just repeating storylines from the past, but, like, with new twists on them. So, I mean, like, yeah, I guess we're going to see another 
crisis storyline, but what's it going to be this time? Like, he's clearly coming to Earth. It's going to happen, but, like, how are they going to do it this time is the question. They have to be able to do it in a new way, or else people are going to really start bitching and complaining that the new 52 is just, like, 52 repeat. I, well, I, I think know. the multiversity is definitely going to have something to do with that. The big, uh, big, long-planned multiverse story Grant Morrison has been planning for five, six years now. I think, I think definitely this will be kind of a catalyst for at least some of the storyline there. I don't know if that's true, but I know that they are going to branch out with more multiverse stuff. Like, uh, well, I mean, I mean, I've read rumors and things like they're going to. Uh, well, you know from Future Zen that there's going to be a big war and people from Earth 2 are going to invade uh, the prime Earth. And you know, or I've heard, that they're going to do a lot of weird multiversal stuff during this thing called the DC Band-Aid, where they're going to, or called by the guy I hate from Bleeding Cool, uh, the DC Band-Aid. Uh, but it's supposed to fill in the gap while they move to the Burbank offices. But anyway, it's supposed to be about multiverse stuff. So I think they're going to they're going to do multiverse things with Handy Monitor. Multiverse. Okay. So there you have it. There you have our opinions. So where do you think uh, where do you guys think the story is going to go? Uh, let us know in the comments below, but that is it for the this week's time. Um, there's a lot more to discuss, so check out uh, the extra scenes uh, after the the show here and um, let us like I said let us know in the comments what you think about the the uh, Forever Evil Dope series, uh, anti monitor, anti monitor the character, and the multiverse or multiversity, and, and all the wonderful things coming up uh, down the pipe. So thanks very much for joining us. And that's a wrap for another episode of the Comic Book Showcase. Join us again live via chat or Twitter next week. Like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. And to learn more about today's topics, check out the Marvel and DC databases on Wikia, the ultimate resources for comic book information anywhere. Hey guys, you know, just want to thank you guys for watching and, uh, you know, we appreciate all you guys subscribing to our video. Keep on subscribing and, uh, you know, if you got any ideas, make sure you throw them into the comments. We're always looking for uh, new thoughts on what we're going to do for episodes. So, uh, you know, if you've got any, throw them out there for us. Again, thanks and subscribe and like and check us out on Facebook, check us out on Twitter. Thanks. Bye.